Welcome. This is an update on the book of Acts. I'm so glad that all of you that are studying with me are having a good time and enjoying it. I was just at a church service here a few weeks ago and a man came up and said, he was an usher of the church, said, I'm with you in your Acts. He said, that has been the best thing. He said, I've never had a discipline to actually sit down, set a time aside every day for the study of the Word of God. He says, I'm doing it with the book of Acts. He said, my whole perspective on the New Testament is changing, just finding out the history of all these moves, all the moves of the Spirit, the healing movements in the cities and in the churches that are being formed in the book of Acts. So that great testimony, music to my ears, because that's exactly what I'm looking for, is a group of people that will understand the importance of the Word of God and carry that on to another generation because the Word of God is the most important part after you're saved. The object of faith for a sinner is Jesus, but the object of faith for the Christian is the Word. And that's why we grow in it each and every day. We've taken up sections of it. I've been giving you updates on it, so I'm just trying to keep up with all of you guys. Some of you are studying ahead and told me that because you just can't wait. Others are just keeping up with the schedule that uh, was given to you and the timeline. But uh, today I want to talk about through Acts chapter 10 through Acts chapter 14. This section, because this section really typifies change. Not everything remains the same, even in the body of Christ and even in your own Christian life. Chapter 9 introduces to uh, Saul of Tarsus and in that chapter he became Paul the Apostle. Although he's not called that until we get to chapter 14. And uh, when he goes out on his missionary journey. And so in this particular case, we're talking about how that uh, Saul became Paul, caught the gall to the, to the ministry. And even by chapter 14, he has drastically changed in his own life. But so has the church as he's been ministering to. The church began in Acts chapter 2 with the church at Jerusalem. And the church at Jerusalem became the center of all missionary activity, people going out. But more and more in the city of Jerusalem, religious people are getting saved, Pharisees, receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. In fact, we are even told uh, in the uh, Acts chapter 6, a number of the, uh, those religious people got born again. A number of the uh, priests were obedient to the faith when the groups of people went out from the church and began to minister. Even the disciples in the church of Jerusalem were able to win over some of the hardest cases as, as in Acts chapter 2 when Peter led those 3,000 devout Jews out of every nation under heaven to the Lord. This continued on into chapter 6 as they went out and began to minister in the streets and even the lay people from the church who went out those that were just serving as ushers and deacons and those that were working in the church, you know, helping the widows, they're the ones that went out and began to preach and they won these people over. That's what knowledge of the Word of God will do. It will convert just a standard Christian into a great disciple and a minister in his own right. And so this thing began to happen. But as it goes on further and further, we're now running into problems. By the time we get to chapter 13, there's going to be a real problem with Peter uh, going out and ministering to the house of Cornelius because Cornelius was a Roman. And so the church at Jerusalem got all upset said about this, basically that the gospel did not belong to the Gentiles. So Peter came back, gave his testimony, and immediately the place was changed. His testimony swung the thing over. Paul mentions in the book of Galatians how many times he's gone to the church at Jerusalem and given updates on testimonies he had, how that God poured out His Spirit in these Gentile areas. And every time, although it was harder than the time before, he won them over until finally God began to tell him it's no use anymore. The church of, of Jerusalem has gone so far and Jerusalem will be destroyed and the city will be destroyed, the temple will be torn down, as Jesus had prophesied it would happen. But the great thing was, and, and a, the great outstanding thing was, is the church of Jerusalem no longer represented a resistance to Satan, to the Roman Empire, or to religion. And all of a sudden religion began to take over. And that church in Jerusalem began to try to in, in affect other churches that were being established. So we come to chapter 10 and in that chapter we again have uh, the moving of the Holy Spirit and the great revival that occurred at the house of Cornelius out of chapter 9 where not only was, was Paul or Saul become Paul but in that chapter also Peter received a housetop vision and in chapter 10 went to the house of Cornelius and a great number of Romans in that city. A great number. And this is where actually what took place when Jesus said it will be in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then the uttermost most parts of the earth. Samaria was chapter 8, but chapter 10 begins the uttermost parts of the earth, which again was the Roman Empire. And so uh, whenever that happened again, 
Peter was there to see all this happen. But then in the next chapter, what we find is very interesting. In fact, it's almost kind of subliminal. A man from chapter 4 begins to appear, and this man that's there is Barnabas. Barnabas made a big splash back in chapter 4 when at the end of that chapter, he came and gave an offering to the church. He sold a piece of property and came and gave it to the church. And so all of a sudden, people begin to talk a lot about him. And this incited, inside Ananias and Sapphira to do the same thing, except they lied about it. They sold it for a certain figure, kept a certain figure, but it told the church they gave the entire amount. God didn't care if they kept some of it, and Peter wouldn't have cared if they kept some of it, if they'd have been truthful about it. But they lied about it, and both of their lives were taken by a demonstration of the power of God in the church service. But we find it all started with Barnabas, and Barnabas was just a loving man, tremendous man, very faithful, and God called him, and in chapter 11, he begins to go out, and he really wants to found a grace church. He would, he wanted to find something in grace, and so he went out to the city of Antioch, and he noticed there the people in Antioch were hungry for the gospel, but they were not religious people. This was not a stronghold for the Pharisees. This was not a stronghold of Judaism. So he started seeing people coming and he was so impressed with the grace of God. And he figured the only other person that could help me was the former Saul of Tarsus. So he went and found Paul. And he and Paul helped to found this church, and it became a tremendous church. In fact, it became after Jerusalem, and Jerusalem began to slide downhill, the church at Jerusalem. Chapter 11 is the rise of the church at Antioch, and from that time on, all of Paul's missionary journeys were based out of the church at Antioch. Antioch became a Gentile church, strong in the grace of God, and in fact, it became so strong that the leaders of Jerusalem became jealous of what was going on there, and they wanted to stop it. This became an aspect of chapter 2 of the book of Galatians where Peter in that chapter was sent by the church of Jerusalem to Antioch to find out what was going on and what he was supposed to do was uh, send back messages to them telling them here's what's happening. But when he got there he was so impressed with the grace of God and they put him up to live for a while while he was there in a home of some Gentiles. The Bible says while he was there he did eat with the Gentiles. Now you figure that one out. What does eat with what the Gentiles mean. That means he ate what Gentiles ate. I'm sure at first he began to think, oh my goodness, they're serving me sausage for breakfast. Then he remembered his housetop vision. And in the housetop vision, God basically says the eating things are gone. Now this represents people that you thought were unclean and now you're eating with them because they are clean by my blood. And now they've been made a part of the body of Christ. And so Peter began to eat and probably great, gained a great love for sausage in the morning with his eggs. And then probably somebody served him shrimp one day and then it got into lobster and I mean all the stuff that was unclean under the law. So not only pork, but other things. And he began to eat them. And all of a sudden, man, he fell in love with that place and loved the church service. Can you imagine walking in and they're not asking the men if they're circumcised? They're not measuring skirt length, their hair length. They're not all these legalistic things that they probably did in Jerusalem were not even mentioned. And none of this, and there was no preaching on the law because these were Gentiles and Gentiles didn't understand the law. And probably if some things were introduced by Paul and by Peter, it was a proper understanding of the law that this was a type of Jesus. So they saw Jesus throughout the entire Bible. And all this was happening in the church there at Jerusalem, I mean in Antioch. And guess who forgot to ride home? Guess who forgot to take anything back to that church in Jerusalem? It was Peter. And the Bible says that, all, that the church at Jerusalem got so upset because Peter wasn't contacting them that they sent out men from the church. And these men were Pharisees. And by the time they hit the city of Antioch and Peter saw them coming, the Bible says in your King James, he dissembled. The word dissemble means he became a hypocrite. He moved out of the house of the Gentiles into himself, quit eating with the Gentiles, and all of a sudden he became Jewish again as far as his actions were concerned. And what happened was it split the church at Antioch. His one act of hypocrisy split the church at Antioch. And it even says in chapter 2 of the book of Galatians that even Barnabas was carried away with his dissimulation, with his hypocrisy. And Barnabas joined in with Peter. And so he's the leader of the church, the pastor of the church. And it took Paul bringing Peter up on the platform and chewing him out in front of the entire congregation to stop what was happening at the church of Antioch and get it back to a grace basis. So from that grace basis, 
Paul began to travel. By the time we come to chapter 13, here's what happens. The church was established in Acts chapter 11. And then by chapter 13, there's a prayer meeting going on there of the leadership of the church at Antioch. And it says there was at the church of Antioch certain apostles and teachers. And it goes on to say, and the Holy Spirit spoke out during that prayer meeting and said, separate me Barnabas and Saul. He was still called Saul at the beginning of chapter 13 and said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. God ministered to Saul or Paul and Barnabas and they began the missionary journeys of which Paul had three of them. And so from there in that chapter, they went out and they established the church at Galatia. In fact, the book of Galatians is the next book we're going to be taking up uh, toward the end of the fall here or in the fall season, we'll be taking that book up because it's the first church. And from Acts, again, the center hub of the New Testament epistles, Galatia was the first church that was established. So we'll be taking that one up because that is such a tremendous view. And remember the background on that. It's that chapter where there was such tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God and the mercy of God and a church rapidly increasing, filled with love toward God and love toward people, not caring what nationality you were, not caring if you were a Jew or a Gentile, not caring if you were Roman, not caring if you were a Greek. All these different people came to church, men, women, young, old, not caring if you dressed a certain way. And so the church was flourishing and out of that came the first missionary journey. And Galatia was established in the same mirror image as was the church at Antioch. It was a great movement of grace. And then what happened was the leadership of the Jerusalem church began to follow Paul. And wherever he left an area, they would come in right after him and they convinced the Galatians they needed to go under the law, which was so stupid because it was a Gentile church acting just like a, a, a Jewish church and they were acting like Jews and going under a law they were never given and eating food they were never commanded not to eat. All the stuff, the things that happened in the Old Testament was now being transferred over to them. It's so typical of what's going on today is people don't understand the role of Israel in the world today and so they try to think that if they act like Jews and all this they in essence become another church of Galatia and it's important we understand that Israel as a nation is blessed, a physical nation but as a spiritual thrust in this earth, they will not come back to what they used to be until the church is removed at the rapture of the church. And then they will take the whole leadership in the evangelism toward the world and the teaching of the word of God and discipleship to the world in the time of the tribulation. So with that going on, we see tremendous things happening here in the book of Galatians and by that. And by the time we come to chapter 14, again, Paul is in those missionary journeys and his missionary journeys has begun. And then he'll be coming back and giving great reports to the church at Antioch of what happened. What a great mirror image of what the church should be today. Again, I come back to it. For those pastors, again, who are out there and you're studying through this book, I trust you one thing you'll understand. You should have a great respect for the nation of Israel as far as national uh, Israel is concerned. Physical nation. That God has His stamp of blessing on that nation. There will always be a nation of, of Israel. And throughout all history, basically nations are judged by God in world history by a world viewpoint of how they treated Israel and uh, how they treated them as a nation because nations have come and gone, but Israel is still here. And God just told Abraham in the very beginning, your nation's going to be blessed and will be around forever. So from Abraham came two offspring. And the two offspring are the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven. And those two represent the two races that came out of, uh, out of uh, himself, out of Abraham. And so Abraham begat a natural seed called the sands of the sea. And that natural seed is the people of Israel, Jewish. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have those genes inside of you and you are a Jew. Then you come from one of the 12 tribes. So again, this encompasses the earth today and it's a physical race not spiritual, not going to heaven because they're born a Jew, but have a great physical stamp of blessing on them that they stand for that nation. And they are a guidepost in this entire world of the faithfulness of God, that no matter how often nations have tried to destroy Israel, they cannot do it. But on the other hand, God said, from you would come a race like the stars of the heavens. This is a spiritual race. And of that would be made up of kindred, tribe, tongue, nations all around the world. He said, in you shall all nations be blessed. That is the spiritual seed of Abraham, which is the Lord Jesus Christ would come from him and he would draw all the nations to himself. That's the spiritual race that would come from him. And through trust in Jesus Christ, people can have redemption. As Abraham did, he believed in the Lord. It was accounted to him for righteousness. So we need to separate the two. Your church needs to be open to all races, all nationalities, men, women, young, old, no prejudice set in there. You don't need to make your, your building look like Jerusalem. You don't need to put a wailing 
wall in the church. If you have pictures of it now and then and use those as examples of the Lord, that's fine. I know of churches that take a time and they'll have a teaching session. Or they'll take the Passover or something like that. And they'll even talk, they might even have the elements set up there and they'll talk about how each element represents Jesus Christ. That's the way it should be. The Old Testament was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. Jesus Christ is seen in every sacrifice. He is seen in every feast day, fast day. All of the holidays that Israel has is wrapped around the Lord Jesus Christ and the plan of redemption. So again, you understand that this is what again made the church at Antioch so great they could properly study the Word of God without slanting it toward one particular race or another. Because in the church age we have today, God is open to everybody and anyone who comes to Him, whosoever will may come. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, because the moment we get born again, doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, young or old, educated or not educated, it simply says now we are all members of the body of Christ, one body of Christ. And whether we're Jew or Gentile, male or female, young or old, bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one cup, and that one cup is redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. So ministers, you are studying with me. Come back to this fact. God is looking for churches that will deal in grace. I'm not talking about open to sin. I'm talking about grace to where people are allowed to be themselves. If they do sin, according to the Bible, they have an opportunity to come and confess their sins like anybody would, and Jesus, like anybody, again, will cleanse them of their sins. Jesus Christ is that one who wants to do that. So again, open to anyone to come in and not being prejudicial toward age. So many ministers I know today that are in their later life, you know, they're so prejudiced against young people. Don't be that way. Open the door and let them come in and let them have leadership in your church. And uh, basically what I see that's happening in so many churches where older ministers are there and surrounded by younger ministers is that the congregation wants the young praise and worship. They want the young leadership, but they want the old man's wisdom and that's what Jesus Christ has really given to us. They, what we in essence need in a good church that teaches grace like Antioch did was we need the enthusiasm and we need the strength and the vision of young people, but we need the wisdom and especially the finances too of the older people. And together we work together for that common cause of winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapters 10 through chapter 14 is an incredible section again of God taking older things and making other things out of it, of Saul becoming Paul, of a church at Jerusalem now morphing over and God raising up another church uh, that was the church at Antioch, a church of grace. And we have Peter getting this house stop vision in Acts chapter 10. He goes to the house of Cornelius. And here we see the, 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 uh, uh, the evolving, basically, spiritually evolving of a man named Peter that went from so Jewish minded now to openness to what God was doing around the world. And we need to be the same way too. And so let the grace of God permeate your church and permeate your ministry. And especially from this section of Acts chapter 10 through Acts chapter 14. Next Next time we come back and I talk to you and bring you an update, we will take up chapters 15, 16, 17, and 18. Good stuff.